Good afternoon. I'm Caroline Stevens. Welcome to Stepping Stones interview. Today I'm interviewing Kaz Clark here in Watford. Welcome Kaz. You're going to talk to me about, and everybody else in fact, about the Penturk incident. Now Penturk is an area of Sa Cardiff? It's in the suburbs of Cardiff, yes, right. in South Wales. And what happened there? Oh goodness. And um, when was it? The incident itself happened at 20 to 3 in the morning uh, in the early hours of the 26th of February 2016. And it started for me on Tuesday the 23rd of February 2016. I came out of my house and noticed a small grey twin propeller plane just flying over my village. I didn't really pay it any mind at all. We have RAF St. Athen just down the road, which is an RAF base, and we have military planes all the time, so it, it's nothing unusual. Anyway, it was the next day that I really started to take note of what this little plane was doing. Dave, who's one of my neighbours, uh, so it was there one day and it came back the next day? It was there <coughs> the whole time. I'm so sorry. It's still going. Um, it was the next day that I noticed this, still, this little grey plane was still there and my neighbour Dave had come out of his house complaining that this little plane had kept him awake all night. So it was then that we really started to take note of what this little plane was doing. And a bit later on that day, another plane, almost identical to the first plane, would turn up and then the first plane would leave. And they never left the airspace unwatched, not even for a minute. And it has to be noted that to this date, those planes have never been acknowledged as having even been there by the Ministry of Defence. Anyway, Wednesday night, that was all I could hear. Every 15 minutes, a twin prop plane would fly over my house in a figure of eight pattern. Occasionally it would fly out into a big circle and it would come back and continue the flight pattern. And this went on day and night. By Thursday morning, we had eliminated everything else. And we decided there and then that they must be watching for something. This was bigger than just a small military exercise. It costs an awful lot of money to keep a plane up there 24 hours a day for no particular reason, having no particular place to go. So we decided that that night, if it was still there, that we would go out and watch to see what was happening. And Dave was absolutely convinced that the Russians were coming, that they were gearing up to escort the Russians from our <laughs> airspace. Because at the time they were sailing some antique aircraft carrier in our waters, complete with Russian planes. So we really didn't expect what happened next. Um, it got to about 2 a.m., and I was just about to go back into my house. It was cold, it was February, and to be honest with you, I was just a little bored of watching this little plane and nothing was really happening. And we could hear this other plane coming. It sounded like a missile. It came in so fast and so loud and really low. And as it went past us, the roar of its engines, it was huge, this plane. Now, we had a full moon that night, and as the plane banked around to the left-hand side, you could see this mushroom-shaped object on its back, and Dave immediately exclaimed, oh, that's an E3 Sentry plane. Well, I'm sorry, I said, I'm not a plane spotter. If it's not a Cessna, I don't know what it is. I'm sorry, I never wanted to be a plane spotter, so I, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> and it didn't mean anything to me. It does now, however, but at the time, um, I thought, well, things, are, things have changed. I'll stay a bit longer, so I threw another log on the fire and watched as this plane started to circle. And it didn't do small circles. It took, we estimated, five minutes to do one revolution. Uh, and I can see in every direction but north, because that's where the actual mountain is. Um, and seven times this big plane went around before the first red light was visible high above the trees behind my house. And I shouted for Donna, one of my other neighbours, who was also watching with us. She'd gone into the house to make hot, hot chocolates, actually. And I called Dave, and we ran to the gate that overlooks the farmland behind my house, so there was no obstructions in front of us. And Dave ran through the gate. He got halfway down the field, and I'd stopped by the gate, and I called him back, and I said, look, I don't mind watching, but from a safe distance. And he hesitated for a while. He was looking at something I couldn't see. But he came back to the gate reluctantly, and we both stood and watched as one red light turned into three. That was the very top and very point of a huge pyramid craft that came in point first, 
with the leading set of six lights on its underside on the oblique angle, brighter than the rest. And as it came into our world, through a black veil, through a fog that wasn't there, this thing didn't de decloak, this thing got brighter as each light came into our world. And when it was fully here, then it swung down very slowly and still turning very slowly anti-clockwise until it righted itself in the upright position. And when it did, it jettisoned <coughs> this green object at the top of it really fast. And I can't, I can't tell you what shape it was. It was too bright. It was brighter than the moonlight. And it just stayed there waiting and watching for something, just swinging from side to side and not going anywhere. And you had no idea what it was. You, you knew it wasn't conventional aircraft or anything like that. Absolutely. I was just stood, in, you know, people have asked me, what did we talk about? Absolutely nothing. We stood there in complete shock and awe of what we were seeing. This thing was majestic. I was, it, after the green thing came out, I, I was so fixated on it touching the ground that I didn't see the top, such was the size of it. And I have described it like a high-rise building, that if you watched the man walk through the front door, you wouldn't have seen the man jump off the roof, and vice versa. And I was glad that Dave was with us, because he said he saw 15 or 20 of these red, he described them as orb-shaped objects come out the top of this graft that just seemed to hover around the very top of it. Um, and I was fixated on it touching the ground. And as it neared the ground, this, I've described like a hand of lightning reached out to touch the ground, but it, it was more like a plasma ejection to stop itself from touching the ground. And the whole thing lit up really brightly from tail light red to this really bright white orange, but still brighter on the right hand side than any other part of the ship. And it illuminated so much that it illuminated parts of the side of the ship, showing it was a solid craft and not just a string of lights. Um, creating light and shadow almost, like a rock face, yeah. something that wasn't smooth but was solid. Um, I heard the military planes coming, two big propeller planes I now know to be C-17s, American planes. And I looked up, I was still standing on the gate, and I looked up to see these planes go over the top of me. When I looked back, I couldn't see the pyramid anymore. That's not to say it wasn't there, I just couldn't see it. The green object was still there. And the two other planes came from my left-hand side again. Very, very big twin propeller planes, like two engines on each wing. I believe them to be C-130s, huge Hercules aircraft. Two of them came from my left-hand side. They came behind me, they both turned, and they both went after the two planes that had gone in front. So now you've got two planes in close together and two big planes out wide, covering an enormous amount of airspace between them. And this green object has flashed three really bright strobes at these planes. I believe a deliberate attempt to get their attention. And all four of these aircraft followed the green object. And the green object bobbed away. I described describe like a happy child or a happy puppy, seeing a tree for the first time, excited almost. I also believe they expected a chase. They closed the entire country's airspace. Um, How do you know that? We checked the radar yeah. um, when the planes were going overhead, when my neighbour didn't get an answer from the Ministry of Defence to find out what these planes were all about. They, they just didn't answer him. So we checked the flight radar. Clearly they were on flight radar. The radar track was there for us to see. But when I checked from my IP address for planes overhead, it showed no data available at all. So to this day, as I say, these planes have never been explained by the Ministry of Defence or anyone or acknowledged as having actually been there at all. And that's the only time it's ever happened to you. So you'd never, did you believe any, any of this before you'd seen it? No, your own eyes? no, I've seen things that I can only describe as unexplained or unidentified, but it's never compelled me to run out and have to tell the world about it. This changed everything I thought I knew, everything I believed and everything I understood went straight in the bin. And everyone that I thought was a conspiracy nut, now I'm that conspiracy nut, because I've seen it. And I took a lie detector to prove what I said I saw was real, and what I said I saw was true. Because lie detectors are work on fact and not fiction, meaning it had to be a real event, and not just something I believed or imagined. It has to be based on fact. I did it primarily because I wanted to be honest with my doctors, because my health has been affected since being in close proximity to one of these objects.
In what respect? In what way? In many ways. Were you healthy when you when it happened to you? Yes. <clears throat> um, I'll say to start with it, it, it started as a blood anomaly, a blood disorder. Um, and I don't know if I could say this on camera because there are still tests going on, but I'll probably know a little bit more a little bit later in the month. Um, so you're going for regular checkups now? Or just tests? Just tests at the moment, minute. but it's... They think I have cancer. I hope I don't, but if I do, it can only be because of the high radiation that is still in those fields today. And two years after the event, over two years after the event, the radiation is still high there. The EMF is still high there, still clicking, you know, showing us harmful to human beings. So how high would it have been on the day? Wow. Well, that's some tale to tell. Indeed, it, it goes further than that. After we watched the green object disappear into the distance with the four planes going after it, I was still standing on the gate and we could see something red moving behind the tree line. We weren't sure what that was at the time. And these two red barrel-shaped objects, about the size of a small car, started coming across the fields towards us. One going across to my left, and then it was approximately 30 feet away from me, and again 30 feet high, if that, and stopped above the hedge to my left. I stared at it just for a few seconds, trying to glean all of the details I could, and the inside seemed to be moving like white noise on a TV screen. And I looked to see where the other one was, but the other one hadn't stopped, and by that time it was right next to me, right next to the oak tree, next to me. And that was still red, but that came right over the top of me and stopped. Were you able to film any of this at all? No. <coughs> Took you by surprise? Not that. We couldn't get anything electronic to work. Ah. Oh. Um, Dave's phone, is, he's still got it. We know there's some very interesting audio messages and photographs on that phone. But it was fried. He still has it. But until we can find someone that can remove the memory chip safely to retrieve that information, and it's vital that we get that information, um, then it's... It's useless to us until we can find and glean that information. Um, but will absolutely prove beyond any doubt what happened. And so what happened then? Standing on the gate, and we could see two red objects moving behind the tree line. We couldn't really see what they were. And these two barrel-shaped objects, at the size of a small car, started coming across the fields towards us. One going across to my right and one coming across in front of me to my left. It was about 30 feet away and about 30 feet up, if that, and stopped above the hedge. Tail light red in colour, flattened on the top and on the bottom, smooth sides, and looked like white noise on a TV screen on a red background. And I stared at it just for a couple of seconds, trying to glean every bit of detail I could, and then looked to see where the other one was, but the other one hadn't stopped. And it was right next to the oak tree, right next to me. It came over the top of me and stopped. I don't know how high it was. More than 10 feet, less than 20. And it paused for a moment. So how close was this to you, then? I was standing on the gate with my hand up because I waved. Right, OK. Um, and looking at the photographs now from where we were. Weren't you scared? No. That's the strangest thing. But were you being drawn to it as well? It was like someone reached in and took the fear out of me. Absolutely the strangest feeling. So it wasn't a case of head for the hills then? No, not at all. Dave, on the other hand, was absolutely petrified, scared stiff. And I was the complete opposite. Almost felt elation and sadness that our military had pursued them. But obviously our military must have deemed them hostile. Anyway, this barrel thing that was over the top of me changed colour. Like someone flicked a switch. And it went from tower light red to traffic light green, and I could see even clearer the white noise jumping around inside of it. And it just paused for a moment. I felt energised. And no fear. And the green barrel started to move away. There was no noise, no downdraft. 
just silently over the rooftops. And then the red barrel that had been there the entire time, stationary. Then the red barrel started to move away across the fields. And I could still see the red barrel right until it got to the ends of the fields and it faded to black. Now I don't know if the lights went off or it, if it cloaked or if I just couldn't see it anymore. After that we went home. Dave came back to my house, I should say. And we didn't really say a lot either, still in shock. I remember being so cold. I've never been that cold before in my life. Like I'd been out there for hours, but in reality, to me, I'd been out there four minutes. But we have lost an hour in time. Dave, You're never the same again. No. Dave went home, but he couldn't sleep. I went to bed, I couldn't sleep. And I lay there and I heard this enormous explosion coming from Plantrison. And coming from where? Plantrison, oh, right. which is yep. approximately five miles away. And tell you about the Apache helicopters that came from left to right, flying in a pyramid formation. They're red, big red, slow pulsing lights going out in front of them, so much so that you could, you could see the grass and the shrubs and the trees moving under the weight of their rotor blades, moving from my left to my right in an attempt to intercept the green object. And it was the next day, I don't know how or when I fell asleep. It was the next day I woke up with this overwhelming need to tell someone, anyone that would know what to do with this information. I considered myself a borderline agoraphobic, so this has changed my life in so many ways. I would never have spoken publicly. If someone had told me prior to what I witnessed that I would be here speaking to you even. I would bet everything I owned that I wouldn't be. This didn't even come into my thinking, let alone my five-year plan. This changed everything. And I suppose so many questions for me, because I'm not the only witness. And I wonder what our military would say to us if they could, because every pilot, co-pilot, crew member saw that craft, the same as I did and that craft returned from where it came. Wow. Wow. That's a story. It's real. I wish it was a story. It still affects me. I do believe I had some form of post-traumatic stress after the event. My emotions were all over the place. Up one moment, down the next. Just everything. I, I'm in a new world now. I feel like a lost child. I don't know anyone. Anything and everything I thought I knew doesn't exist. I'm 53 years old, and this has changed me forever. And I want the world to know, the whole world to know, what I saw was real. Well, I wish you well with all mm -hmm. the tests. Thank you. Um, please keep in touch with us. And to our Stepping Stones awareness audience, please do your research. Don't take our word for it. Have a read about the Penturk incident. And please watch us again. Thank you.